Hello and welcome. In today's lesson, I'm going to be talking to Peter, who is a psychotherapist, and we're going to be discussing how to deal with exam stress. And in particular, I'd like to ask you some questions about how to get over not having done so well in the exam. So, Peter, thank you very much for coming on today. You're welcome. So, the first question I'd like to ask you would be something that some of the members of the English Pro Tips Facebook group have mentioned, which is what happens when you do the test, you don't get the score you were hoping for. How do you go about is it, do you need to forget about it or do you need to reset from that? But how do you go back to do the test with a, with a fresh mind and confidence after something like that? Mm. It's a good question. And there's a lot in what you're saying that's worth unpacking. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I would say is you need to accept that if it hurts badly, that you have not got the score that you wanted, the obvious thing is you really want to do this. This isn't just something casual. This is something you really want. Now, the stress that comes from going for something that you really want and not quite getting it is actually the right stress. It's, it's logical. It's completely understandable. The question is, how do you unwind from this very tight position that you put yourself in? How do you understand what are the stories that you're telling yourself? Are you saying that the test is unfair? Are you saying that the examiner was too strict, that they didn't give you a chance? Or are you looking more at yourself and saying, I should have prepared better. I should have given more time to this. I shouldn't have gone out with my friends for teas or coffees as much as I did. So there are two ways of looking at this. One is how you blame the organization that sets and administers the exam. And the other is how you blame yourself. Now, both of these are natural, but they're not useful. They're not useful because they take a lot of your energy. And you're going to need energy and time and concentration to prepare for having another go at the exam. There's another thing that I want to add, which is it's also worth understanding what kind of stories you tell yourself about success and failure. Now, these are stories that you would have had in your head way before you've taken this exam. Stories from when you were uh, 15, 12, 5, it depends when you first took your first competitive exam, depends on what country you're in. Now, if you passed early exams in childhood and teenage and did well, then the story you've got is, I pass things, I'm going to do well. If you had trouble passing your early exams in childhood and teenage, then a possible story you've got is, I'm never quite going to make it. I'm always going to be almost. And actually, both of these stories have their problems. If you've always passed things, then you feel, I deserve this because I'm someone that always passes. If you've had difficulty in the past with exams and the stress of exams, then one of the stories in your head is, that's me. I'm the person that tries and fails. So what you need to do is identify calmly over a cup of tea, glass of water, on your own with a notepad, calmly look back at, age 5, age 8, age 12, age 16, whatever age. But go through looking at the exams you've taken and understanding what stories you've grown in your head. Because if you can become conscious and aware and understand the stories that are in the background, then they're not, they're not going to come and grab you and ambush you and surprise you if you unfortunately have a, um, a result that's not the one you want. Mm. Um, now, you mentioned blame, so blame towards the organisation, so in this case the British Council, IDP, um, and blame towards yourself. I blame myself. I shouldn't have gone out for tea with my friends. I should have studied harder. Um, 
how can you acknowledge those feelings and then move on from them? So the, the challenge, it's a, it's a good phrase that you're using, how to acknowledge them. So definitely it's good to allow whatever is in your mind to come out. And for me, it's always best to write it down. Why did they set this exam harder than the last one? Why didn't I prepare? Get it all down on paper, if that helps, and I think it usually does. And the goal is to move from placing blame on them or on yourself, to move from placing blame to taking responsibility. So taking responsibility is calm, sober, quiet, gradual, determined, and saying, okay, this has happened. I've gone through my stories in my head about my reaction to what has happened. Now I have to make a response and I have to take responsibility. It's me. It's not me in the past. It's not them. It's me now having to take a calm look about maybe what preparation is best to do from now going forward. Did I rush into the exam because I was so keen to get it done? Um, did I give myself enough time? But actually, did I waste quite a lot of that time in the preparation? Um, you know, there's different possibilities. The third possibility is maybe this really isn't right for you. So I don't know what percentage of people listening to this fall into that category, but sometimes we go forward for something that isn't really our choice, but we've been maybe under pressure from family or friends to go for this. And maybe our choice is to go in a different direction, maybe never to take this exam or maybe to come back to it in a couple of years when we're, we feel better about it. Mm, that's interesting. So in the, in the case of the IELTS exam, the main two reasons for doing it would be, first of all, to study in a foreign country, mm. um, and second of all, to, to move to a foreign country. Mm. So just to um, come up with a practical or, or a, a realistic idea of what you're talking about, are you talking about, for example, maybe someone that thinks that they want to be moving to a foreign country, mm. but actually deep down, maybe they don't want to move to that foreign country. Mm. So that's a possibility. So if you imagine um, inside your mind energy going to move to a foreign country in this way and energy against that, staying where you are mm. or going somewhere else, moving, staying or going somewhere else, if you imagine the energy that goes into that in your mind, I'm pulling very hard. This, this could be quite a stuck place. <clears throat> that actually you need to understand and make clear what your reasons are for wanting to move. Are you wanting to get away from something? Or maybe they're not your reasons. Maybe they're family pressures, pressures because your friends have done this. Mm. Pressures because your partner um, wants you to earn more money and move abroad or whatever. And it, understanding your motivation, your reasons, and clarifying there'll always be some reasons going in both directions. That's normal. But getting them into the open means that there's not a secret private battle in your mind that's wasting your energy. Mm. It's very interesting. And and something that I see quite regularly is the, the flip side of that, which is, I want this so, so, so much. Mm. So the, the I want this so, so, so much, again, you have to clarify, is it I, is it me that wants it? Or I want this to make someone happy? Mm. Uh, father, mother, granny, grandpa whatever, once you've clarified that, once you've made it clear to yourself, then the I want this so, so much is a good guide. It, it means that you really, really want this. And of course, that brings up pressure. So then you have to consider in advance of taking it for the first time, or if it's a retake, you have to consider what sacrifices you're willing to make. What things are you willing to put aside to really concentrate on this? And making these decisions may, may not please people around you who want you to work in the family business, who 
want you to have a holiday, who want you to look after the children more. Um, so very important when you really, really want something, and maybe you're going for a retake, to get people around you on board. Mm. Now, your impulse might be to, to go into a tunnel and just go straight for it, this preparation for the taking of the exam again. You may not be aware that you're excluding people from that tunnel, and they may feel left out. Um, they would probably want to be part of your team. But of course, that requires some discussion, mm -hmm. some negotiation. Um, and you might not look forward to that because your family, your partner, your friends may bring up reasons that you don't like about maybe delaying the exam or maybe about um, even questioning whether you should be doing it at all. And the, these are important conversations to have because if you can make clear with them really what what your reasons are, then things can get a bit more relaxed. Then they will be surprised when they understand really what your reasons are. They might have it wrong in their head about what your reasons are. And you might be surprised. All of this takes away stress, which otherwise is part of the big ball of stress that you're wound up in because I guarantee I promise you that stress is not just about that day you take or those days you take the exam stress tends to bundle up in, in like a snowball so you have to see what the different elements are and look at them one by one and some of them will be hard for you to look at but hard in the right way Mm, that's very interesting. And, and I want to touch a bit more on this, this idea of people around you. Mm. So a lot of people that I see going to do the IELTS exam um, have supportive people around them. But then there's also the other side, which is a lot of people who are doing the IELTS exam have a lot of pressure, particularly from their spouse, because the exam is, is well, quite an expensive exam to do. And sometimes it requires doing it multiple times. And that's sometimes not understood by the spouse that sees that you speak fluent English or mm. that sees that you're studying, but maybe not all the time. Mm. What do you think? So, so what we're talking about there with a, um, a partner, a spouse, family member who is um, saying these things, what we're talking about is fear. So we're talking about your loved one's fear that... Um, you know, the normal things about fear are, are usually labeled to do with time or money. Mm -hmm. Fear that, um, you know, we won't have time in our life for you to do everything you want to do because we've got other priorities. Fear that we won't be able to afford the money to pay for a second or a third exam. Sure, there's something real within those fears, but quite often things like time or money take in other fears. So it's worth risking a discussion with someone close to you. And you've got to pick your time. I'm not talking about when you're both exhausted, last thing in the evening and you're bursting with it and they're exhausted. You've got to discuss when would be a good time for us to look at this and give them some power to say, you know, let's leave it a week. I, I just don't want to, my mind is full. Allow that, mm. come back to it. And then what you need is to look at what their fears are. What are their fears if you fail again? What are their fears if you pass? Because, of course, one thing about passing the exam for them is it opens doors across the world. And it opens doors that they might be scared of. Like, what happens if you go and work abroad and we're separated for a period of time? You get a job somewhere and I can't join you yet because I need to work in, in the family shop or the business here. We will be separated. So these are genuine fears which come really from the heart, that come from being concerned and, and loving towards someone, but they get translated as panic. Mm. And then panic is like a, a thing that builds. They panic, you panic, they fear, you fear. And before you know it, it's off the scale. So getting back to the root fears, the root fears about how will we be okay if, if, if this does work, if you do get it, 
how will we, we still manage? How will we do our arrangements with the family, with the children and every you know, all these questions. There's a lot more than just heading to that gate of the exam, which seems so simple. Mm. Um, now, I mean, this is, these are really interesting conversations to have with the people around you. Um, could you give us some idea or some tips or some advice on, on how to have these difficult conversations? Should I mean, you mentioned that we should try and find a time when, it's, mm. when it suits both, of, mm. both parties to have a conversation. Mm. Um, should we be blunt about the way that we ask questions to try and find out their fears? Or should we take a more subtle approach? Well, um, of course... The, um, the tendency, if we really want to get something done, if we really want to make this conversation happen, is to put too much emphasis on a one-off conversation. So it could be that you need a single conversation followed by a second or third one once your partner or your family or your friend has had time to think things over. And that gives them a chance to change their mind. You, you can't force people to change their mind. People sometimes need a bit of time. So it's better to have these conversations earlier. And the, the tendency for human beings always is to put things off that we don't want to do. So look at that and look at yourself and say, well, if I keep putting off these conversations, they're not really going to go away. So... Um, and you need to give the other person or persons a chance to set the agenda as well. So it's, it's not all your points that you're looking to get across. You want to ask them what their concerns, what, what they would like to discuss. When you do that, you might want to be careful how you label that. Because what you could say, given what I've said, is tell me what your fears are. Whoa. Nobody likes to admit that they're scared. Very few people, very rarely. What you might want to do is to say, let's look at the different sides of this situation. Let's look at the different aspects. Let's understand what we need to take into account together for this to work for both of us. So rather than point the finger at them and say, I think you're scared that if I pass this, I'll move to a foreign country and never come back or fall out of love with you. Well, that fear might be there, but I think it's best to keep that in the back of your mind and be more open and relaxed about your inquiry together and allow them some 50% of the power to say, look, I don't want to talk about this. Then you can say, well, fair enough. Um, Maybe when would be a good time? I don't know. You're picking up information. If they tense up, then you know that there are difficulties that they haven't spoken to you about that may be embarrassing for them because they maybe know how badly you want this, but, but their worries are not going away. Um, you know, they might, have, they might have grandparents who are getting old that they don't want to be separated from. Mm. Um, they might be helping one of their parents with extended family or business, and they don't want to have that discussion with them about leaving. Um, you know, in some situations, you might not get the result you want. And that's very difficult. You might realize that the values that you have are actually moving apart. Sometimes it's possible to make those clear, those values those beliefs, those wishes for the future. Sometimes by talking about them, you can bring them together. Other times, as you talk, you realize that you're really different, that you might have, if, if you're learning English and taking the exam, you might have ambitions to really expand your life, to live abroad a few years or, or for a long time, or even to live abroad permanently. And it could be that this is not what the other person is willing to do. And in, that what they're doing is they're focusing all their fear on the exam, on, on maybe the cost of doing the exam or the time it takes to prepare. But actually underneath, you maybe have values that are much wider apart than maybe when you first came together. That's very interesting. And, um, and for many of the people that I speak to, 
that stress often comes um, through physical symptoms. And I was wondering if you could uh, just tell us a bit about the mechanism and, and why it is that we often feel stress in terms of physical symptoms, mm. things like head headaches or um, sweating a lot before mm. the exam or, mm. or hearing high-pitched sounds as well in, mm. our, in our ears. Mm. So um, a lot of these physical symptoms are coming from something good. It's the body preparing. The body saying, okay, we're listening. We're listening to the brain because the brain controls these things and affects your physical body. And the brain is saying, this is important. Well, watch my fist. This is important. You know, if, if I was to hold my fist like this for quite a while, my, my arms would get sore. So your body is doing what it thinks you want, getting yourself ready, getting yourself focused, getting the, the physical aspect of your body alert. Now, if you really, really want something, sometimes your body over-prepares and gets too tense, too short of breath. You need a bit of focus, a bit of tension to get moving, to and then you have to teach your body that it's okay to relax. Your body is just obeying your mind. So really this begins with you noticing and acknowledging, like I just did. I found myself making a fist, which is an external uh, picture of what's happening inside your mind and body. Acknowledge, understand, become aware of what's happening, step back from it. And I might have said in a previous uh, video, exhale. We normally think to relax, we have to inhale. The best way of resetting our lungs, our body oxygen system, is just to let a long exhale come out. And there'll be ways that you already know, uh, which you maybe have neglected, um, running, swimming, yoga, really good idea if you haven't already to introduce these into your daily routine to give yourself, your body, a chance to let go of some of these tensions. If you haven't got anything physical that you do, you need to find something. Right. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. And, and when you said that, it reminded me of, of when I was at university and, um, and my flatmate and study partner was very good at working very intensely for an hour and a half. Mm. And then he would take a 30 minute break mm. where he would run or um, walk around a park mm. nearby. And then he would go and do another hour and a half mm. intensive study. Mm. Is that the kind of thing you mean? That's definitely part of what I'm talking about. And for some people, it might be 20 minutes and then a 10 minute break. For others, it might be 40 minutes and a half an hour break an important thing is to be nurturing and kind to yourself rather than telling yourself off it, it doesn't work if you tell yourself off because that creates new tensions so you will find yourself telling yourself off or telling someone else off for that matter come back to yourself come back to your breath take some exercise and then almost draw a line and begin again and say, okay, I think I'm going to be kind to myself about this. So kind to yourself might be stopping when you're tired. So most uh, studying that's done when we're tired doesn't work. It just tires out the body. So it might come from our determination to pass the exam, mm. but we have to, what, what you're talking about, Eli, is effective studying so um, studying in a clever in a smart way which may mean putting a limit on the amount of study you do so the graph improves improves and you stop before things drop away rather than totally tiring yourself out and your body you know needs rest your mind needs rest uh, uh, and it is very effective to have those rests in between short periods of study. Set a time on your phone, 30, 40 minutes, and then set a time for how long you're going to 
have a walk, relax or whatever. Try in those spaces between studying, try to do something physical rather than staying on the computer and doing emails or web searches. Not not the best way of relaxing. Why is that? Why is it good to do something physical? So the amazing thing about the body and the mind is they're all connected. But what we tend to do is when we're focusing on mental work, we tend to forget that the body needs physical feeding as well. And we're all different on how we might do this. You know, someone, for someone it might be um, running, for another person swimming, for someone else a martial art. Um, they're probably things that you've got that you maybe have neglected because you're working so hard on your preparation. And you might think, well, I haven't got the time to do that. Well, my answer would be you haven't got the time not to do it, mm -hmm. that it's more risky neglecting the physical because if we separate body and mind, neither works so well. The body drops, the mind drops. We need to get body and mind together. And, um, you know, the, the one tradition is, is doing a scan, uh, a meditation of your body. You can look up body scan and you'll get examples of body scan meditations. That works for some people, taking you through the whole of your body and joining body and mind together. So that's the kind of thing that people could put into Google or yeah, another search engine? Just put body scan and you'll get lots of examples of fairly simple uh, guidelines to how you can integrate mind and body to make friends with your mind and body again. Mm. I can imagine a lot of people will feel very comforted hearing that because um, I have spoken to students that, um, for example, love running, but when they go running during their exam period, they feel guilty. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it must be a real um, relief for them to hear that, well, by continuing with that routine, mm -hmm. they're actually doing themselves some good. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're saying reminds me of being back at university doing exams in the library when everyone's got their space at the desks in the library working like crazy and you get up to go for a walk, 20 minutes, half an hour, you come back and the person sitting opposite you is still still sitting there working very hard. Immediately you think, well, they've got a half an hour more studying done. It's not necessarily good studying. You know, it could be that it does suit them doing a long chunk or it could be that they're just pushing themselves too hard and the body will take revenge. And one of the ways the body takes revenge is, well, I've had enough. It starts tensing up. Mm -hmm. And then mind and body, everything's, you know, your oxygen levels go down, not good. So um, the, the trick is, is to notice the guilt happening. Notice when you get angry with yourself and let go. Notice mm -hmm. it grow up again and let go and move towards taking good responsibility, which is a, a grown-up decision for how to plan your studying and how to discuss it with those around you. Mm -hmm. um, I like that you um, mentioned seeing other people in the library, because one thing I'd like to talk to you about is, um, especially in IELTS, we get a lot of people um, celebrating their success, for example, in Facebook groups or or, for example, my Facebook group, when students and members of English Pro Tips do exceptionally well on the exam, um, I'll post about that. And sometimes I worry that when I'm posting about their success or when these students are posting about their own success, um, they're actually putting a lot of pressure on everybody else that's not able to reach that same level. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, you, you might have to be careful if you're the sort of person who can be and we're all a bit different, who can be badly affected mm. by reading about people's success. You might have to avoid the channels of social media where that's going to come. Obviously, you can't avoid bumping into someone in the street, but um, you know, our, our anxiety often makes us want to search out how are they doing, what's happening with them. If it, it, for some people, it motivates them. Mm. So some people... You know, realizing that someone's run 0.1 of a second faster in the 100 meters makes them try even harder. And, and it's a good competition. 
not for everyone. For other people, it makes them feel smaller. It makes them feel like failures. And we're just different. So it's good to know, are you the person that needs to hear about successes to get you moving in a good way? Or does it make you feel, what's the point of this? In which case, you need to guide yourself away and resist clicking on that channel for a period of time and operate more in your own bubble, not in a very networked situation. We're different. You need to know what works for you. Mm. Um, now, I'd like to go back to what you mentioned about um, other exams. So often we we look at how we've done in, in previous exams and, and we bring that to um, to the IELTS exam. Um, how, how can we be more aware of... Um, of what it is that we take from other exams and, mm. and understand the similarities and the difference between an English proficiency exam and maybe the maths exam we had in high school. Mm. So in, in terms of your brain and your brain's attachment to your body and generating tension or relaxation, excitement or rest, your brain doesn't make any difference between a maths exam when you're age 12 to get into high school and the IELTS English exam. Your brain doesn't say, oh, that's a different exam. Mm. The brain just brings them all together in one big networked lump in the mind, even if it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Time collapses with these things. When we've had a shock or a surprise, say age 12, we didn't get the maths we needed to get into high school. When we get a shock, our mind remembers shock as if it's much more recent than the, than the date actually is. So you need to understand and make conscious for yourself what these shocks were. So the only way I know is calmly to sit down and write out I remember when, and look at different dates, different years, I remember when this music exam or this sports camp exam or whatever it was, um, you know, you didn't get the high jump to the level you wanted. Uh, you didn't get into the team for this sport. Uh, you didn't get into the orchestra for this instrument. Whatever it is, you need to calmly map these things and understand that they are probably having an effect Mm. on your confidence moving towards this exam. Now, putting that aside, the other thing to do is to map successes, is to map when things have gone well at different times in your life. And most people, even if you've had a tough life, most people have some successes. And you might think, oh, but that was just in a, you know, a little village cake-making competition, or that was just a tiny thing. Well... Um, tiny successes can be made bigger and can feed you in the present if you become aware of them and remind yourself. And again, uh, all I know is that writing a memory, I remember when this happened and I did a you know, good preparation and this was a, lo a lovely result. So making yourself aware and putting your mind and body in that moment. You know, I am saying it in the present tense. I'm 12 years old, I've just passed this exam or I've just, you know, won this race or whatever, something good and really experience it in the present. Mm -hmm. So what that is, is, is bringing some of the good things back into your life that you might have pushed aside, saying, oh, that's nothing to do with it. That was long ago or a different area, not the IELTS. Actually, for the brain... Um, you can bring things from long ago into the present and be nourished by them. And you can also bring things that are not specifically to do with this exam, but other situations that you've been resilient and you've moved through. Similarly, there might be situations where you've had a tough time. You maybe didn't get the result you wanted. And you might have managed. Mm. You might have worked things out. So journal spider map about those things as well 
And it is a source of pride, isn't it? Yes, because, you know, we, things don't always go right. You know, we, we're making a, a meal for a loved one on the first date and we burn it in the oven. You know, so what did you do? <laughs> did you close the oven and say, well, let's go out for a meal? Did you work it out together mm. and have a, have a laugh about it, you know? It's interesting, when you were um, saying that, it reminded me of a professional climber I know. And, um, and he has this, I don't know if it's a mantra or something that he likes to repeat, regulate to himself. He says, it's just like me too, and then he inserts a phrase. Mm. So it's just like me too do the climb on the second go. Mm. It's just like me to be able to um, forget about the bad time. It's just mm. like me too. And then he inserts phrases that um, he wants to uh, believe in himself. Mm. What do you think about that approach? Mm. So taking that kind of sports psychology approach mm. and, and applying it to, mm. to an exam. So the, the good thing about that phrasing, it's just like me too, is... It adds a bit of humor. It's like, oh, it's just like me to forget about this. Um, it's a bit like you're parenting yourself, like you're being kind to yourself and nurturing and say, oh, these things happen. It's just like me to forget to do this. And it, that presses the reset because you're acknowledging it, but you're acknowledging it very importantly with some kindness and relaxation rather than maybe the brain's habit, which is to become tense. Usually when we're tense, when we're stressed, we're not in the present and we're not grown up. We're usually um, channeling, impersonating a angry parental figure from our past or, or recent past, or we feel like a child again being told off, but it's us that's doing the telling off of ourself. Whereas what you're saying with the climber, it's just like me too, is a nice phrase that he's come up with that relaxes him, that brings him into the present moment and presses the reset button. Right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of those tips. And there's a lot that we can uh, go back and digest from the conversation. Any last ideas that you want to add or are we ready to wrap up? So I suppose um, just simplifying what I've said, that things that are affecting us in the present are not always to do with what's happening now. They're, they're quite often to do with the past. If we put a wall down, we need to take the wall down, bring things into the present, remember, be conscious about these events, and that helps us let go of them and have for them to have less power over us. That's the first main point. The second main point is to bring mind and body together again. It's almost like when we're studying, we chop our head off and it's like a, a head on its own without the body, no good. We need to bring the physical and the psychological, the mental back together. And we need to be kind to ourselves in the preparation. And maybe finally, just to recap, is assemble a team, get people together who you know can be supporting you. And it may require some difficult conversations at first to get them on side, but it's well worth doing in the long term. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you very much. Um, so for all of you watching this, um, I wonder if you could comment below the video and um, just let us know, how do you deal with stress? And also, do you think your approach to dealing with stress will change having heard our conversation today. So you can put a comment in uh, just below this video. Thank you very much for watching and good luck with all of your studies. Goodbye. Bye.